So, um, it's awesome being here at DeployCon. Um, the PASS community is kind of like a family. Um, like any family, you have your arguments, um, which is what we're going to have now, really. Um, it's a bit of a tradition at DeployCon. Last year, there were almost fisticuffs, so um, we thought we'd get the protagonists, or at least one of them, uh, back in the room to, to have another go. So uh, I'll have the gentleman on my left uh, introduce themselves quickly and uh, say what they do in uh, bite-sized chunks. Sure. Sinclair Schuler, CEO and co-founder of Apprenda. Uh, we are an enterprise private pass focused company. Mark Copeland, CEO of Active State. Uh, we are a company focused on developers and enterprise since 1997. We have a suite of solutions from code to cloud. And what's relevant to here is we have a, a private pass solution called Staccato. Cool. Cognizant as well that this is a community event, so if anyone has any, any questions or thoughts, um, there's a roving mic, feel free to, to chime in. Um, I guess, gentlemen, you know, PaaS is, is where cloud generally, cloud infrastructure was five or six years ago, and, and back then um, there were long, lengthy d debates over public versus private. Um, you know, Adrian is, is in the room um, and, and obviously believes that, that public is the way to go. Um, you know, why is, why is this any different? What is, what is the value prop for, for, for private pass? And is, is, is there any ongoing value there? So I, I can start. I don't think that there's a requirement per se. It's more the constraints that an organization functions under. So one of the discussions early on was uh, Dave's about uh, data gravity. And we think about data gravity in the context of what happens with the application workloads and where they need to live. And I think you mentioned, you know, if the data is easy to move, you can move it. If it's not, then the application has to move to the data. So there are basic fundamental constraints that drive behavior around what cloud selection you pursue, whether it be public or private. We don't believe, for example, at Apprenda that private is something that is the end state. The end state will be hybrid. You will find that enterprises of all sizes are using both private and public resources. So in that context, it makes sense that it's simply a um, discussion of what the requirements and constraints might be that make that decision meaningful. Uh, so for example, one of the models that we use is if we look at the application portfolio of any enterprise like Intel, uh, you might say, well, there's a, uh, there's a constraint around data itself and there's some set of applications within the portfolio that simply can't be dislodged from their data, so that keeps it private. There might be security constraints, either real or perceived. It doesn't really matter from the perspective of the customer. Perceived security constraints are as real as anything else. We work with a lot of people in banking and pharma, for example, where regulation and auditors alone prevent certain data workloads from moving to public. Uh, and we can zoom that out into, say, performance and dependency discussions. Each one of those constraints are these concentric rings that add more complexity to the decision. And that forces behavior that says, well, we want to bring past value into the mix. Just because we can't consume public due to these constraints doesn't mean we should leave it on the wayside. So we find that our customers actually end up building some very large private pass environments and focus on the value derived from the pass as an operating model as opposed to a hosting model, which I think the distinction between public and private. So I mean, but fact, isn't that a short-term opportunity? Well, I mean, I want to expand on what Sinclair said because we, although Sinclair and I do have different visions, I do share that vision. We see very similar aspects. I don't think there isn't a day where you're going to say private or public. It is a world of hybrid. Uh, everything that Sinclair says, we see. The one thing I wanted to add to what Sinclair said, another typical, two other scenarios that we see where private and public make sense. One scenario is you have a development team, they're prototyping, they may be prototyping in a public environment because it's easier for them to throw up a credit card, but when it's time to go into production, then they need to come into private because of the data and security issues that Sinclair mentioned. Another scenario that we see is you have a private environment uh, because of total cost of ownership, it makes sense, but you want to burst out to public. And so then you can use private paths to burst out. So um, my point is that I don't, the, the whole aspect of you know, public cloud consuming the world, is, it's not going to happen. You're going to have private and public and hybrid. So I guess um, if that's the case, if, if, if it is very hybrid and different workloads in different places, then the, you know, that speaks to another point, which is this, this uh, I guess, question of, of, of open, um, in, in broader terms, versus closed. And, and with open, you get uh, arguably uh, more flexibility to, to put stuff where you want it, to go with vendors where you want it, to, to, to move stuff. Um, you know, Bart, your thoughts on, on that, that sort of open versus closed debate, not from a dogmatic religious perspective, but from a, what it actually means for right. enterprises. Now, when you say open, do you mean open private paths or open cloud? I just I want to clarify, clarify the question. So, so, um, Open, open standards, kind of uh, building community around around a pass as opposed to as opposed to more proprietary right, and more closed. Right. Right. Well, I I'll speak from two perspectives. The first perspective is 
what we see our customers asking for. And they cross the full gambit from one extreme is the customer says, you know, we don't care if it's proprietary open, we just want it to work to our needs. The other extreme is uh, customer says, we like that the fact that you're building solutions on top of open source. That gives us freedom, that gives us comfort. Um, and then it's in the middle as well is that uh, we see a situation where a customer says, as long as we can have access to the source, we have visible source, and we can play with the code, and we may be able to even contribute back to you guys, uh, that's the, the, the spectrum that we see. Sure. Um, yeah, and, and we think open versus closed in that context is potentially the wrong question, right? When we think about open versus closed, it's a discussion about managing risk. It's understanding what it is that uh, you're making a decision around, what the risks are of choosing one versus the other. Neither is right, in my opinion. I think that there's organizational strategy that plays into this. Uh, there is kind of value and vision. What is it you want out of a technology? The biggest risk right now, when we look at it from a platform as a service context, is portability. It's about being able to run your workloads where you need to run them. This goes back to the hybrid discussion. So rather than open, it's are you using a tech that doesn't force you to run all of your apps exclusively in one place? If you yeah. get into that scenario, you are closed in a different way, and that portability problem ends up being the riskiest proposition in that decision. Sure, I, I guess um, the, the, the open side of the house would say that open gives you uh, another level of security of safety, another safety net um, in, in terms of that portability, in terms of that choice. It, it may, but it also would introduce things like what you see in the JCP with Java and very, very slow evolution at scale. There are negatives that crop up all the time, right? I come from an OpenBSD Linux background. I spend my life as a C++ developer and Java developer. So I'm very aware of this world. Um, it's not new to me. There are positives. Some of it is risk mitigation, but you do have that trade-off. The nimbleness on the closed side gives you the ability to say, well, we need to make a decision around customer requirements today. We're not going to go through a process to figure that out. We're going to make those decisions and kind of tailor things around customer value. You focus heavily on making things work in a way that's efficient for the customer. So again, I don't think there's a right or wrong. I don't think you look at this and say, well, oh, if it's not open, I'm not doing it, or if it's not closed, I'm not doing it. It's kind of what are, what are the priorities when you look at a technology? What is it on the past side that's most important to you? And what we find in the field working with our customers, it tends to be that they say things like, well, it's got to work. It's got to ensure um, kind of portability for us, de-risk the future. We want to be able to make decisions around public or private in the future without the tech that we select getting in the way. Those are the things that are more meaningful. Open versus closed shows up on the list like seventh, right? This isn't okay. something that's, that's that meaningful. And we end up with pretty big deployments like that. So, The other thing, I think, open versus closed, it also, like Sinclair says, there's no right or wrong answer. Uh, from our perspective, our roots are in an open source. We've built products on top of open source. We've tried to add, add value on top of open source. So we tend to um, converge around open source projects and activities. Um, so it, whereas uh, other companies, you know, they'll build a proprietary solution. So I think there's two points of view. Is that there's the enterprise customer's point of view and how they want to work with open versus closed. And then it's also you as an organization, as a vendor, how you're building solutions. Your, your, your culture and yes, your industry. Right, yeah. So I guess the, taking that enterprise side, um, you, know, you, you guys are talking to customers all the time. What are the top, top three um, things that they're looking for, top three sort of yeah. value, value props they see with, with PaaS? So I can tell you what we've experienced uh, with respect to customers that are in production, right? That's, for us, at least a better, a better model than speculating. Um, we find there are a couple of value components that are tactical and one primarily is strategic. When we look at enterprises, and this has been very typical over the course of, say, the last 30 years, is every five to 10 years, they make choices around app platforms that shape how they write applications for the next 10 years. Why do they do that? When you look at developers and uh, what they build, the architecture patterns that we use, the things that we use to build new classes of applications change over time. We started off with mainframe and moved into kind of mini computer desktop models and then client server and we looked at RMI and all that stuff. Then we got into web and SOA class apps and now we're into the cloud app era, right? So what is a cloud app? And you start to break it down and you find that you have things like distributed app principles, multi-tenancy at the application tier, service principles and mobile that drive a lot of what we call a cloud application today. So the strategic decision and the strategic value for the enterprise tends to be that they're looking for technology in past that replaces the app server metaphor. They want to commoditize modern architecture patterns. They want to build better apps more quickly. And they want to do that at a blistering rate that has nothing to do with DevOps value, right? So number one for us that we find in our customer base is that they're saying, what is the target app dev platform of choice going forward? And how does that equip us to build this new class of apps? The next two pieces of value that we tend to find are second around utilization of the organization. That includes the infrastructure and the people, right? 
how do we take that 8% number that Das had mentioned before and drive it to 80% across all of our workloads? Pass tends to do a very good job if it's built properly to achieve those numbers in the context of um, web and SOA workloads. We see that with some of our customers. JP Morgan right now is running one of the biggest environments you can imagine uh, with Apprenda, and they've got over 2,000 applications running on the platform. Utilization literally obl obliterated their KPI targets. That alone was meaningful, but that was tactical value that uh, forced money savings, not reshaping innovation going forward. And third, it tends to be around removing friction and complexity from the system. Uh, this is a discussion around how do we acquire resources more quickly, how do we get apps up and running more quickly. That is less tangible than the utilization measure, but I'd say that's a third kind of piece of value that we see enterprises drive toward. Okay. Uh, your top so, three. Uh, the top three things that we see, I, we have more than three, but I'll focus on three. Um, in no particular order, often uh, org enterprises come to us and they're intrigued about the concept of platform as a service. They like it, but for security reasons, they want it behind their firewall. So it's kind of like uh, security because it's their culture or because of uh, governance or data security reasons. The industry uh, they're in. It's, so it's security. We hear that over and over and over again. Uh, another key value driver that we hear for private paths is eliminating the complexity. You know, I loved uh, Dave's talk this morning of the, the glass in the middle, because that is the enterprise, and they're looking at ways of eliminating the complexity. And how do you deploy applications quicker, faster? And private paths is seen as a way to do that. So for us, it's all about the agility aspect of uh, bringing private paths in the organization and what usually takes weeks or months to do in an organization because of their complexity with private paths, you can do now in minutes. So, and then so, the, sorry, oh, sorry, yeah. yeah and, the, and the third area that we see that are driving the value for PaaS is around innovation. Uh, for example, we're dealing with Qualcomm, they're a customer of ours, and they specifically wanted private paths for all about innovating around their, with their development teams. Well, it's interesting. With that innovation thing, yeah, I've spent a lot of time talking with Christian Riley from Bechtel around um, the reality for the enterprise and, and his reality as he sees it and he, he believes for, for enterprise generally is that you know the old stuff sitting on, on old kit is going to stay there forever. And so simply to your sort of second point, the tactical part of, of, of forklift, forklifting stuff and, and, and removing some of that pain, in, in a lot of cases, in a lot of um, maybe not early adopter enterprises but the sort of you know, middle, middle majority, they're, they're not going to move their apps. So, so the, the value lies in, in, in the greenfield stuff. And so, you know, but what do you what do you think the realistic potential is for for those existing apps to be to be forklifted over, especially as you get higher up the stack yeah. and it's more a more complex operation? I, I'll just I only can speak to what our customers are telling us because we hear both. We hear if it's not broken, um, we're going to leave it alone, and there's no way we're going to move it off bare metal. Uh, there are other organizations that say no. We're intrigued with PaaS. We want, to, we want to migrate our existing applications over to the cloud, but we also want it for new greenfield applications. So it depends on the organization from what, from what we, from the types of interactions that we see. Sure. Okay. Yeah, and I'd say it's also primarily based on the tech, right? So when we look at a customer and we walk into these discussions, they have these very large app portfolios of, you know, whatever, 1,000, 2,000 web and so apps they've built over the past 10 years. And there's a fundamental ceiling to your ability to provide value to those existing apps. So you, can't, you can't do certain things with existing applications that you could with greenfield apps. That has to be fundamentally accepted. If it is, and the tech understands this, then a PaaS can do things to instrument cloud-like value into an existing app. It will never get it to the perfection of a greenfield build. You will not achieve the same boundless uh, value that you might in the case of writing brand new applications. But it's absolutely part of the PaaS vision to go in and say, well, you have these web and so workloads which of them are past compatible to a degree and what level of value can you extract. So it's a bit more of a spectrum than it is a binary yes or no. Um, so I think one of the things that happens in our accounts is that the ROI and the payback of investing in pass tends to materialize very quickly around the existing workloads and how they can remove friction from the system and boost utilization on the infrastructure side. The problem that I have with most pass vision, I think this is where the market diverges a little bit. We have a very different view of what pass is supposed to be, is those greenfield apps that going forward next 10 years of apps we write how do we make it easier to write new classes of applications? Pass is supposed to fill that uh, app server metaphor going forward. And if it doesn't do things to make it easier to write new classes of applications, then it's a very diluted vision. So you end up with value that is exclusively tactical, but then it doesn't apply entirely to the old app portfolio. So you end up with a pass that's kind of good at nothing. Um, so when we think about it, it is about making sure that you can br bring the tactical value of moving the old app portfolio as much as possible into a more modern cloud infrastructure era. But then second, can you equip through the past the developers to write this new class of app? 
And that's where things get very, very interesting from a value point of view because that's the explosive value. It's about what people are going to be writing as apps for the next 10 years. Sure. And on, on you know, uh, DOS mentioned that from Intel about uh, building applications that are cloud aware. And uh, speaking from the enterprise perspective, there is, as I think I was noted, I can't remember, I think, yeah, DOS mentioned this, is that it is still an early market. And for the most part, uh, the enterprises that are exploring this is using IBM's term are pioneers. Now, they're pioneers in this market. And the types of interactions we're hearing from the enterprises are, one is just the simple deployment aspect. But then what Sinclair is mentioning, we are hearing the odd signs of, can we build applications that are cloud aware? This is the future that Sinclair is pointing to. But I would say a lot of the enterprises still today are much more basic in their needs, wants, and desires when it comes to pass. They, they don't have that vision yet. You know, yeah, so I, I disagree. But. Well, I, I, it's interesting. I think if we're talking about um, where organizations, where enterprises are at today, where we think they're going in the future, um, it does really, it's a good segue into the, um, it wouldn't be a de deploy con if we didn't have the, the uh, polyglot versus best of breed uh, discussion or argument. Um, you know, it would be easy to look at an enterprise, look at the world around an enterprise, and see that that's changing rapidly. Uh, and as such, the, the, the ways that the enterprise thinks today are going to be very different from, from what they think in the future. And that's going to, that's going to have an impact in, in terms of the languages that are used. So that, that, that debate, you know, we need to go through it again. What is the realistic future for an enterprise in terms of languages and frameworks? Bart, I'll start with you. Cause so uh, I'll start with our philosophy, and because the market is very large, and in active state, we have built our business around uh, building solutions uh, with disparate systems because of the entropy talk that Dave said, you know, enterprises are that middle. Um, so we believed that it was necessary to bring to the enterprise a polyglot uh, private path solution, a solution that speaks to the heterogeneousness of an organization. And so from our perspective, it was, uh, as we say in our marketing, any language or any stack. And to create an environment so that an enterprise could configure their development practices to the PaaS environment, as opposed to having to change their um, development practices to conform to the PaaS. So we wanted to make it really easy for enterprises to work with the languages, the databases, the frameworks um, that they wanted to work with. And so that was our philosophy and mindset towards approaching private paths to the enterprise. Because our experience has been, and it goes back to our roots, is that we've been doing build engineering around Linux, OSX, um, Windows, HPUX, AIX, and we felt it was necessary to, to apply that same methodology going forward when it came to private paths. Okay. And, it's, and, and it, was our, it was our philosophy, it was our approach in order to service our customers based on our experience our customers. So power to the people, give them the choice to do what they want to do in the way they want to do it. That's right, yeah. Yeah, and, and I'd say we have a, a practical pass view of the world that's a little different than that. Um, so one, it's not about the number of languages that you support, it's what you do with them. So one of the things we've seen in enterprises, for example, is that the number of apps that are architected to be multi-tenant has skyrocketed. When I say the apps are multi-tenant, I don't mean that it's running on multi-tenant infrastructure. I mean that the app at the row level and on the data side or on the NoSQL side, in the runtime, on the execution side, are single instance shared. And we see this over and over and over again as a pattern in enterprise architectures that are being built today. So when we think about that, what's happening is that the developers are burdened with building Salesforce.com-esque multi-tenant apps. That's a burden that we remove from the table. So when we look at the vision of past, this is the whole thing that we talked about. We say, well, Apprenda, in our case, and this is a vision statement, not so much a vendor statement, believes that PaaS is supposed to instrument modern architectures into otherwise standard web and SOA apps. You build a data model on our tech, and we instrument in columns, new foreign keys, reroute stored procedures, do all kinds of interesting work at the SQL tier to all of a sudden introduce row-level multi-tenancy into a DB that wasn't prepped for that, and the app code doesn't change. So here, developers get the ability to achieve multi-tenancy without doing it. That's what we talk about when we say kind of next-gen vision of uh, equipping developers to write modern apps without having to do the work. So when we do that, we can only do that because of depth. We can look at something like .NET and Java and SQL Server and Oracle at the runtime level and instrument some very, very deep value to make that happen. That is a non-portable construct. You can't take that and all of a sudden slap it on Node and somehow make it interesting. So I think one is, what do you want to do with your pass? Are you looking to shift the way people write apps and introduce very deep value? 
If you do so, it's unlikely that you can support 80 languages because these are, again, non-portable constructs. The second thing is that this is the practical view of the world. Who here believes that the US is a two-party system, politically speaking? Well, we have the Green Party and the Libertarian Party and the Communist Party and all kinds of other stuff, right? You know, fundamentally, enterprise IT is like that. It's a two-party system. .NET and Java still reign supreme in most enterprises. You look at O'Reilly book sales, and the top three of the top five are .NET, Visual Basic .NET, or sorry, uh, C Sharp, Visual Basic .NET, and Java. You look at Google search trends, and you see some huge disparity between what you see on the Ruby PHP side and Java and .NET. So yeah, fundamentally, there's a lot of net new development. In, in, every, in every age, hasn't there been someone saying the dominant paradigm is dominant and will, and will remain the same? The same. You know, it, it can, the it'll strategy. happen for now. Uh, Daz was talking yeah. about the, the amount of stuff that's happening in different languages and frameworks that, you know, within, within Intel. Isn't that an, an emerging trend? And isn't that going to be what powers the enterprise going forward? It may be, but I guess my point is that until we see that at scale from a customer point of view where they're using it for mission critical app workloads like financial transactions or protein folding analysis or what have you, then it's um, a bit ahead of the curve because you're diluting the value prop in the context of the two big parties of the system, but .NET again, and Java. Right? I mean, I only can speak from experience and first-hand experience with the customers that we deal with and what motivated us to do a polyglot solution is that the fact that we have hundreds of thousands of downloads a month of non-Java, non-.NET type um, uh, um, you know, solutions from our, from our websites. And so we're catering to this. You know, what blows me away, it just as an example, and I don't want to get hung up on this particular language, is that how pervasive Perl is as a prog programming language in the enterprise. Scripting language. It's everywhere. And it's, it's, it's built, it's being used all the time. And there are applications that uh, our customers want to be able to deploy using Perl. Well, I but think the other issue is, is that um, enterprises are becoming more and more complex. And what they're looking for is solutions that allow them to, to wrap all of what they do in one particular area with one, with one vendor, with one system, with one solution. And I, I guess the risk of going down the, the best of breed route, regardless of, of whether or not you get a, a deeper, more, more, more functional solution, is that unless, unless you cover all of the needs of, of an enterprise, you know, across the spread of their development portfolio, you know, it's, it's lacking. Not all needs are equal, though, in this context, right? So when you look at any enterprise, there are revenue-aligned application development functions, which tend to be the core of the organization. When we work with enterprises, we focus on mission-critical app workloads that matter to the revenue stream of that company. We don't typically deal with you know, the marketing department building something in Ruby. That's, that's just not our ball game. It's a, it's a ball game. It's a different ball game. If you want to go in and have those discussions, you're not focusing on enterprise private pass as a organizational strategy. You're focusing on a departmental solution around that language and set. So when we talk to banks or pharma companies or manufacturing companies and we're working with the LOBs and IT teams that are building these things out, they have thousands and thousands of apps in one single organization built in .NET and Java that run the most mission critical parts of the business. So that's, that's what we focus on. When we think of enterprise pass, that's the ball game that we care about. There are, um, and I'm not using this as a pejorative fringe kind of development happening that comes out of you know, whatever other language and stack that you might want to use, and that's okay. That may evolve five, 10 years from now from being the language or runtime of choice, but it's simply not the case today. Well, it's not even the, the language or runtime of choice. What it's, it's uh, recognizing and acknowledging is that within a large enterprise, you've got lots of different teams doing lots of different stuff. And sure. what, what CIOs uh, are looking for is, is one system that can give them some clarity and some consistency across all of those different sort of methodologies and approaches. We, we find that the CIOs look for their best return, which tends to be if 85% of the app portfolio is made up in two languages or runtimes then put our emphasis there and then, you know, in fact, economically, it would make sense to have a second pass for the remaining 15%, right? I mean, this is, if you can deliver that much depth value around those two. So the economics behind these things are not very clear. I think that's something that's important to understand, but if you can take a big chunk of the app portfolio and provide value that's three or four X what something else might give you on the pass side, then all of a sudden you make decisions because you end up with an 85% chunk of the portfolio that has a tremendous amount of value to dilute that in favor of consistency across the remaining 15% would be an economical mishap, right? That wouldn't make sense. Uh, you know, maybe just to add to the debate, um, I think you can make cases for both at the end of the day. Uh, we, if, if you look how PaaS is being brought into the enterprise, it's typically an IT team that's driving it, or there may be a development team that is frustrated how long it takes to deploy applications. And so they, they take a private path solution 
and they very quickly can do deploy applications, and this is what we see, and it starts with that team, and then another team sees it, and before you know it, there's a whole bunch of teams starting to use it, and what gravitates it for us is because the second team may be using a different language or framework than the first team. Um, but I can see Sinclair's point of view as well. I mean, there, there are very large organizations that are deep and rich in .NET. There's no question about that. And Java. Yeah, and Java. This year, Java. Are there any um, questions, thoughts from the audience? Is there a roving mic? There is. It's coming. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, since you're representing um, sort of two different uh, aspects, you've got the, the private cloud, and I know you, you do both over there at Staccato, but um, I've noticed something kind of interesting around this concept of, a, of the security or the login, the identity, and what's really interesting about that is it seems to be um, splitting between uh, the enterprise and you know, the consumer. And I'm just wondering, now that we're seeing services um, starting to organize around Pass. Um, are you seeing any sort of? Uh, are you seeing any momentum with this concept of like a cloud desktop, where you have apps that you are ac you have access to within from within your enterprise, and it has sort of its own identity world versus the public? And is that gaining any momentum? And is that potentially, uh, you know, this concept of a desktop is that potentially leading us down the path of really like two? types of cloud, you know, two completely different clouds where you've got, oh, I'm logging into the enterprise cloud versus I'm logging into the public cloud. Are they really starting to congeal around those two ideas? Yeah, I think there are two dimensions to that answer. One is that I think on almost every CIO strategy deck I've seen, the, you know, internal app store is someplace on there with the cloud desktop and this is what all my end users can access. We haven't seen it materialize at scale in any particular account. I do believe that it's something that CIOs and enterprises are looking at from a value point of view, but I think it's further down the curve in terms of implementation. Uh, second, from an identity and kind of off point of view, you know, you end up in this weird situation. You get a lot of past vendors or cloud vendors that go into enterprises and they try to displace everything. Like, oh, you know, the 30 years of work you've done and the $150 million you've invested in the past two years, just throw it away. It doesn't matter. You've got to do it the new way. That doesn't work, and we see this even in identity management. I can't tell you how important that is going in and saying, well, all right, using ping identity or something that CA built or something that IBM built, you have to plug into it. So if you can reconcile the old investments on the identity side with a vision around this cloud desktop and app store and what have you, then I think the answer becomes yes, it's valuable to the enterprise, um, but that reconciliation is important. So the first step is past vendors going in and saying, acknowledging we're not going to displace things you've done for 30 years. Not going to happen but we've built the past technology in a way that we can reconcile what you've done in the past 30 years and um, hopefully hide the mistakes is the best way to think about it and materialize that as a new model that your IT staff and your developers can consume going forward. Once that's accomplished, which is what we see in our accounts and that's the level that we're at at this point, then saying let's go for the full app store vision and cloud desktop might become a reality. So for us, um, I'll speak more to the first scenario is that we actually have customers driving us today on the app store mentality and, and managing identity and actually they've been driving our roadmap over the last six months on specific feature requests in identity management. So that has been a key driver for us um, in the last six months. It's been front and center. Cool. And there was a question down here. <clears throat> this is specifically for the gentleman from Aprenda. You mentioned uh, IP around making applications multi-tenant. Uh, my question is, in, uh, I understand this in public cloud, but in enterprise situation, why is multi-tenant so important? So if you look at enterprise app workloads, both net new development and existing, they tend to fall on one side of some boundary, right? The boundary is either internally facing or externally facing. The number of enterprises writing externally facing applications is going way up those externally facing applications tend to focus on partners, customers, that sort of thing. If we look at that context and that particular use case, then all of a sudden multi-tenancy becomes very real. A good example is one of our customers is Amerisource Bergen, huge healthcare services company. They had an application that was for managing oncology clinics and that app was running on-prem at each of the clinics. I think it was like seven or 800 clinics at the time. Uh, they wanted to move to a model that was easier to maintain and manage over time. They wanted to share data between the clinics. That's something that becomes very real. One way to deal with that is build a single instance multi-tenant app that gets shared across 700 entities. 
So in that case, multi-tenancy on the externally facing side of an app became an architecture pattern that was meaningful. We see this more and more now with enterprises with all these externally facing apps. On the internally facing side, we see it with things like um, businesses that have heavy subsidiary footprints or heavy franchise footprints. Think of Subway restaurants with 36,000 locations. In that context, you'd want likely a single instance multi-tenant point of sale system so that the cost of delivery goes way down. So the architecture pattern of multi-tenancy becomes much more meaningful to the enterprise in those use cases. Thank you. We've got uh, a, a few minutes left. Keen to, um, I've got another question here, but b b before we take that, keen to get your guys' thoughts on, um, you know, this is, this is a progression. Obviously, it's, it's taking time. Um, we all believe PASS is the future of the cloud and the future of the enterprise, but we're not quite there yet. Um, you know, putting your own your own company to the side, how how happy are you with the with the progression? Given that we are very early, and what do you think it's going to look like in, in five years' time? In, time in terms of pass adoption within an enterprise, within a, yeah. a regular rather than early adopter enterprise. I'm personally, I'm pretty thrilled with the progress. If you look at what's happened, it's been an interesting cycle. I think Public Pass has done a phenomenal job of educating the developer community of what Pass is. That has created, to a degree, demand for private pass. What happens is the enterprise developers, the two or three million that are out there in the global 2000, look at this and say, oh, well, we're going to go use Azure, we're going to use Heroku, or we're going to use whatever. And that creates this behavior where pass becomes the de facto target that they want from a consumption point of view. But IT policy, bureaucracy, old school thought prevents them from doing that. So one natural response for IT is to try and block it all. That has proven to be ineffective. You end up with shadow IT and all kinds of other things going on. One other option is compete, offer an alternative that's meaningful, that's private, that conforms to the perceived or real constraints you might have, and go to your developer community and say, hey, we have a pass that you can use. It's as good, if not better, than the public pass, and go off and, and use it. So we're at the point in this adoption cycle where we have an educated developer market that's demanding PaaS, and then the natural response on the supply side for the IT department is, well, let's build one and offer it to you. And in the global 2000, the scale tends to be there. A lot of the companies we work with have 10,000, 20,000, 25,000 developers on staff. Some of them are bigger than Microsoft. Their development footprints are bigger than Microsoft as a dev shop. So you think about that scale, and having their own bona fide internal pass becomes real. And we're at the point that I'd say in the Fortune 1000, we get a pretty good prevalence of real private pass projects that are funded, which we didn't have, I'd say, two years ago. Okay. Yeah, uh, I think that I like what Sinclair said about uh, the public pass market's done a great job of educating the enterprise. And so whereas 12 months ago we were having to educate, we no longer have to educate. Now the discussions are much more around we want this concept of PaaS, but we want it on-prem, we want it behind our firewalls, we want private PaaS, so let's make it happen. I'm very pleased with the progress, uh, but the market is still early. Uh, we typically see organizations starting small, and then based on their successes, it grows out. Where do I think the market will be in five years' time? I mean, what we're betting on, I think the market is going to be really embracing uh, has technology and they're going to see the, the huge productivity gains that they're going to get from implementing private paths that we're seeing with our customers today. To take your developing and provision, the develop and deploy and provision cycle down from weeks and months to minutes, uh, once you start feeding off of that, uh, it becomes pretty powerful stuff. Sure. There's a question here. So my question is um, related to actually the aging of the apps in terms of you know being mission critical and enterprises having invested in those kind of applications and you know a lot of data being locked behind them. So is there some kind of measure that you people have? Or do you, have you seen a pattern in terms of what's the average age of an app, especially in a Java, .NET environment? And you know, typically the app lifetimes are going to be somewhat shorter than the data lifetimes. Uh, and in the context of service-oriented architecture, when you can access the data without really having go, going through the app interface, I mean, how, how do you see this evolution happening and what do you predict would happen in the future? Well, I don't think the application is necessarily sunset, especially, you know, it's a function of how mission critical they are. The more mission critical they are, the longer the life expectancy of the application. I worked at Morgan Stanley on low latency trading systems and those are very old in some cases. They don't go anywhere. Um, so in the context of what we do, given that we go in and focus on these mission critical app workloads, they tend to be attached to revenue streams, they tend to be attached to kind of important savings functions in the organization or transactional parts of the business that matter. Um, they might have been written three or four years ago in .NET or Java, or they're being written today as brand new net new apps in .NET and Java. 
and they're very sticky from a lifetime perspective. These aren't fleeting applications. On the flip side, if the mission criticality is very low, imagine that you're a media company and you're doing movie trailers. You can throw that up wherever you want. You might have like a 90-day or 180-day lifespan, then it can go away. That's simply because the net value of that app, which is really a website in this context, is very low. So I think that the, the value on the mission critical side, or the life expectancy is very durable. And that's where Pass actually has a more meaningful measure of value over time, right? You think of changing that application over time, evolving its architecture, having something that insulates the app from the infrastructure intricacies and everything else is super important in that context. And from our perspective, uh, we see the full gamut from mission critical to uh, simple applications that are, are, are what we call business critical as opposed to mission critical. Good marketing uh, term. Uh, business critical? <laughs> um, and uh, well, that's what the marketing guys say, this is business critical. <laughs> um, and the lifespan of the apps is all over the place. But, and, but the, the power of PaaS is that you don't care about the lifespan of the app. The lifespan of the app could be one day, it could be six months, or it could be five years. The beauty is PaaS makes it super easy, independent of the lifespan of the application. And independent whether it's mission critical or business critical. But I think you, you raise a good point because the reality is, is that we're moving from, from, an, from an application centric world to a data centric world. Um, and, and, and arguably, the, the value of PaaS as, as an application construct, application paradigm, um, reduces as the primary thing is, is about data, is about exposing data to you know, the, the rise of the APIs. You know, it's ex about exposing data to the out, outside world and to mobile apps and whatever. And, and how important is a a, an application framework as opposed to just a broad data accessibility framework? Well, I'd say it's as important. Um, you know, one of the things or one of the takeaways that I had, and I think Dave mentioned this early in his talk, was that it is a two-person dance to a degree. The data is only as useful as the applications around it, right? So in that context, if you have sufficiently complex data that needs to be analyzed, digested in a certain way for the consumers of that data to make sense of it, the application workload is what does that work. Um, how you handle that? is highly dependent on the data. You might require, for example, distributed app principles to properly crunch data in a meaningful way. In that context, the application framework and the runtime matter more than anything. If not, you've got all this latent locked up value that sits in the data store. So I don't think one is more important than the other. I think ultimately when you think about enterprise value in the context of data and apps, you need both in order to make any sense of anything. And you know, this is a question of, well, is this a data company or a runtime company? I do believe passes have to make that decision. There may be different flavors of passes in the future, very, very data centric, where their focus and view is on the data semantics and storage side of things. And on the flip side, there's the runtime pass, which is more on the massaging that data. What does the runtime do to make the data more accessible? So I, I don't subscribe to the idea that it's, well, it's a data centric world. I do believe data has become more meaningful, and we see this through a lot of the effects on the data gravity side but that doesn't um, reduce the value at all of the app frameworks and platforms that access it. You're, you're a past vendor, you have to say that? Not really. <laughs> we'll still make money in either case, right? <laughs> at the end of the day, the PaaS gives you the flexibility. Sure. OK, so we've got a couple of minutes if there's any questions. And we'll have to be very, very, you, you can shout. Uh, one of the features which I was talking to here is there's a combination of private and public no, it's absolutely something that we're seeing, and in fact, we've put a lot of product uh, development work into Apprenda specifically for that. What we do in our context is that we see public pass, at least or sorry, public cloud in the context of enterprises today, as a feature of your private data center. So when you look at PaaS, the fundamental value is get the operating model in place, get the private pass running as part of what you do as an enterprise. And then we have product capability that focuses on pooling resources from, say, Amazon or Azure into your private data center. That pooling effect enables a hybrid view, but it becomes a business decision, not a technical one. So I think it's absolutely part of what we see, and it's, in fact, something we've acted against as a, as a company. And we, we were building our PaaS solution, our private PaaS solution, with the whole concept of flexibility across the cloud, whether it's public or private or hybrid. Um, it's just our mindset. And, and it goes even further in the sense that we're hearing from our customers, yes, we may be on one specific cloud today, but we want to have a PaaS solution that knows, that gives us the freedom and flexibility to move to a different cloud in the future. We don't want to be locked into one specific cloud. Cool. We're right out of time. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks, everyone, Thank for you. your attendance.